Buju, Wago Shindugu, Migizi and Dodame, Minawa, Gazagasquaji Mekag, and Dunjaba. Anin. Today I'd like to share a few thoughts about reconciliation, reparations, land back, and public apologies. These are tough topics. You know, as human beings, we've been through a lot of things over the past few thousand years. And across the world, humans have not always been super kind to one another. Today, we don't get a blank canvas. I think if we had one, most everybody would just paint a very different picture. But we get a canvas that has been painted on for thousands of years. And we can add to that painting, but we can't just start all over, nor can we wipe the canvas clean as much as we would like to. <clears throat> because humans have been hard on each other, there have been oppressions throughout history, and it falls upon us to think about how much should we do to repair and heal and reconcile? How much do we have to do to repair and reconcile and heal? And I'm not here to tell anyone what they must do, but I do have some thoughts as we try to grapple with this history that affects all of us so very much. First of all, I'd like to preface this by saying that what I'm going to share probably will not satisfy anybody on any side of any of the debates. Whether we're talking about a reconciliation effort, formal reparations, or land back, there is, for those who are in the victim community, there is no amount of repair that will truly make all of the injustices right. Think, for example, about the Nazi Holocaust and those who perished in the camps were murdered, never got to have kids and grandkids. Those who killed them did get to have kids and grandkids, and they might have to learn about it. They may have to reflect upon it. <clears throat> there may be a culture in Germany, for example, where they put plaques at the door to each house where a Jewish person was taken that says what their name was and where they were murdered. But ultimately, that won't make up for the fact that all of the people killed never got to reproduce, never got to add to the world. Their lines ended, and everyone who killed them got to continue. And that also means that for those who were the beneficiaries of the Nazi Holocaust, that there's no way that you get to the point where you got to get out a guilt-free card or never have to talk about it again. Ultimately, the issues will keep popping up. I think today it's a little bit easier to talk about in Germany than it was in you know, 1946. I think that, you know, by the time we get 100 years further down the road, it'll be easier yet to talk about, but we will still have a need to talk about it and still have a need to think about what would justice look like. For <clears throat> the descendants of enslaved people in the Americas, no amount of justice actions will truly repair, completely repair, all of the injuries done. For Native American people who, you know, survived genocide or had to deal with residential boarding schools or any number of other horrendous policies, ultimately, no amount of land back or land acknowledgments or, or things will truly repair all of the injuries endured. And for those who got free land in America <clears throat> and bequeathed it to their children after it was taken from Native people, 
there's no way to never have to reflect upon those things. Having said all of that, I, I do not feel that we need to be despondent um, or that there aren't reparative actions to take and make, but simply that we should have our eyes wide open and be practical about what reparative actions and you know restorative justice could actually produce for us. I do believe that it is a worthy effort and that it can do many beautiful and long overdue and necessary things that can really improve the world that we all live in and provide healing for all of us, whether someone in our family had a victim experience or a perpetrator experience, we, we all need healing. So as we think about reconciliation, we do have to do things. We have to move into action once we have established an understanding of bad things that have happened. <clears throat> and ultimately, action can look many different ways, and it may take repetitive, repairing efforts uh, to get us further down the road towards justice. I think Desmond Tutu had a really good way to describe this um, in his book, The Book of Forgiving. You know, Desmond Tutu won a Nobel Peace Prize for his work in South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation. And he has some amazing stories in that book. There was a woman who created a peace institute with the men who had murdered her daughter. And she worked with them every day. I don't know if I could muster the grace for that. But the stories were truly inspiring. And Tutu has a, you know, a way of explaining this. It's simple to say, but not always easy to do. He says, when there's been an injury, it could be an injury between two individuals or the big collective ones, he was dealing with apartheid and so forth, that there needs to be a telling of the story. And ultimately, there is no way to discharge the pain or move forward until we hold space for the telling of the story. Once that's done, we can name the hurt. Uh, it was apartheid, it was genocide, it was slavery, wh whatever it was. And then we can work on the forgiveness part. Forgiveness, by the way, is not saying that what happened in the past is okay. It's just saying that what happened in the past cannot be changed. And we accept that this has happened and now we'll move forward. And then the choice is either to renew the relationship or to release it. As an example, if some guy goes out and cheats on his wife and wants to reconcile, he won't get too far saying, forget about it, it all happened in the past. He's probably got to say sorry and mean it and be believed. And in addition to that, say it'll never happen again and mean it and be believed. And then maybe there is a chance to reconcile. But if he says, forget about it, it all happened in the past, not only is there no way to reconcile, guaranteed a divorce, but it's just much more work for both parties to heal. And it applies to our big collective injuries too. Ultimately, when we do look at slavery, at apartheid, at, you know, genocide, residential boarding schools, all of the things. Even though we didn't orchestrate the injuries uh, or wouldn't choose to, we have received and entered this world um, with all of that in our collective past. And so it is critical that we hold space for the telling of the story. And that's the other thing that the the man in the divorce, you know, or reconciliation example needs to do is listen to the story of his partner's pain, put a name on it, it was betrayal, so that they can move forward. And I think today when we look at the, you know, the historical injustices, holding space for telling the story about slavery, telling the story about genocide, putting a name on those things, this was a genocide, um, that it helps get to the acceptance phase and 
enables us to move forward with reparative action and a different trajectory for our shared society. Many different countries have embarked on truth and reconciliation efforts. And in Canada, for example, it was the formal finding of the Canadian government that Canada had engineered a cultural genocide. And they had a number of calls to action of which they have made an incomplete um, delivery, but it is a start. And even though, you know, land acknowledgements, which I cover in a separate video, are really just, uh, you know, a meager acknowledgement of an injustice, it's just a way to shine light on the fact that this happened. It is one step in a multi-step journey. And once we get to that point, um, it is possible to move forward and to move into action in ways that are meaningful and helpful. I do think that America, for example, has a really hard time holding space for the telling of the story. There's simply put a lot of shut up culture where when somebody says, hey, um, I would like to talk about this historical injustice, there is an inclination amongst some of our citizens to say, shut up, don't talk about that. It all happened in the past. And I think that's really um, damaging to the healing and reconciliation effort, not just for those who've had a, a victim experience in their history, but for those who've had a perpetrator experience too. We are all dehumanized when any of us is dehumanized. Everyone's pain is marginalized when anyone's pain is marginalized. And I think the efforts to, you know, ban books that speak to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the anti-woke movement are really an effort to say, shut up and don't talk about this stuff. And ultimately that's very harmful. I don't think there's ever been a time in the history of humans when the book banners were the good guys. Dwight Eisenhower, a Republican president, said we should not be afraid to have all of the books in our libraries, and we should not be afraid to read all of the books. And it's sad to see that a lot of people have fallen far from that vision and understanding. In fact, I think if someone else's ideas are so terrifying, just to have somebody read or share, then we must have very weak ideas indeed if we think ours can be toppled by somebody thinking or saying something differently than we would. As we do move forward, and I believe we will, it might be in bits and pieces. I think the effort is evolving, not thoroughly evolved. Then it will be time to make more concerted repairing actions. So some people, um, Ta-Nehisi Coates, for example, has made a case for reparations, like financial reparations. Um, there's been an effort at restorative justice through the land back movement as well. And although I do realize that it doesn't matter how much money would be paid in reparations, it'll never fix all the injuries, that one of the things that has happened as a result of historical injustices, is that even the very most economically impoverished white person in America does experience certain privileges. And they do include the privilege to go to school and have your race widely represented in who is teaching. And operate in a country where your politicians are widely representative of your race and culture. And the same is true for, you know, even the most economically disadvantaged white person to go to school and have their race widely represented in the stories that are told, the literature stories, the history stories, and all of that. And as a result, um, there is an experience that white people can have going to school in America that people of color cannot have the same way, which is to go to school and learn about yourself. 
as well as the rest of the world. And another thing that does need to be said with regard to the whole effort at reconciliation and repair is that this well requires some sacrifice from everyone. Among the things that we are asking white Americans to sacrifice, for example, is to share space with everyone else so that when all of our kids go to school, they can learn about one another and everyone else in the world. So that in our politics, it can be more representative of the nation that we live in, which includes significant numbers of black and brown people. That right now, all of our senators in America are millionaires and we should have representation among people who are not millionaires too, so that it better reflects the citizens who make up this great nation. And so one of the things that is being asked for is the sharing of space, the sharing of power, the sharing of narratives. And the more we do that and the better we do that, not only will we deliver on democracy better, but we will open up healing for everybody better. And also as a favor also to the white students to be able to prepare them for a world we can only imagine, but we must imagine will be a diverse place. So helping set them up to get along with everyone else, to understand their neighbors will be so helpful to them and to everybody else. Land back um, is an effort that a lot of native communities have been forwarding. And it simply says that we are seeking the repatriation of certain publicly held land parcels to the stewardship of native nations. It's not about taking something away from someone else. And it should be noted because there are a lot of misunderstandings about this. Um, I'm, I live up here at Leech Lake. Uh, recently, Leech Lake received an 11,000 acre land repatriation. That parcel of land had been part of the Chippewa National Forest, and it was uh, repatriated to the tribe for the tribe to steward for everyone's benefit. And so what happened there, by the way, in America, national parks and national forests are a little different from one another. So in national forests, the U.S. federal government cuts trees and uses it as a business operation and the profits go to the United States federal government. And so as a result, this parcel of land had been clear cut many different times when the tribe took stewardship of the land um, through this land back effort, they decided not to cut the maple forests so that tribal harvesters could harvest maple sap and cook it down to make maple syrup. Uh, they decided to leave any remaining old growth forest sections so that these elder trees would be able to live, um, but also because it would protect a certain part of the ecosystem where a lot of tribal people would uh, forage for mushrooms or pick medicines and things like that. And so actually the environment is safer and healthier under tribal stewardship than it had been under the stewardship of the United States federal government. And also, there are a number of white people who like to hunt on public lands in the Chippewa National Forest, and they remain unimpeded in their ability to do so. The tribe stewards the resources there, but non-native hunters can still hunt and use the land. It did not take anything from anyone. Sometimes people say, oh, those Indians, they'll never pay taxes on that. But this was public land that no one ever paid any taxes on. It did not reduce an asset or access for anybody. So a land back effort is not a taking from someone else. It is simply a shifting of responsible party and stewardship to a tribal entity. Right now, there are land back efforts under consideration at White Earth, at Red Lake, and many other places. 
And another thing that should be noted is that even when there are privately owned white land parcels within an Indian reservation or adjacent to it that is being, you know, an area where there's a land back discussion going on, there is no legal precedent for taking somebody's private land away from them to give it to someone else. The, own, the closest example you'd find to that is if the government wants to build a highway and take half of your front yard, they could do that, but they have to write you a check. But there is no you know, adjudicated remedy where somebody has to give up their private land. So usually if there's like a treaty claims case, it goes to court and the tribe gets a big check. And so ultimately what justice would look like, you know, at a place like Red Lake, for example, where the tribe agreed that they would keep all of the land around Upper Red Lake and Lower Red Lake and at least a mile of land around all the sides of it. Uh, and then the U.S. government turned in a different map a few years later into the National Archives and it cut off a big section of the Red Lake Reservation um, from you know, from their space. And so ultimately Red Lake was lied to, the US government deceived the tribe, but now there've been some white families living there for a few generations. The tribe is not saying that every white person needs to give up their private land parcel. I think really what justice would look like there would be the repatriation of publicly held parcels within you know, really what I think should happen is they should redraw the reservation boundary as originally understood and agreed, which would place some of these public lands and some of these private lands within the boundaries of the Red Lake Reservation, which is, by the way, most of the land at White Earth and Leech Lake and many other reservations is non-native land inside the reservation. And then you could repatriate the public parcels to the tribe and the white folk who've been living there for a few generations could still bequeath their parcels to their heirs. But if anyone wanted to sell, then through an act of Congress, monies could be appropriated where um, people who wanted to sell the land would be selling it to the tribe. And that would, over a longer period of time, restore all of the land and the reservation boundary as originally agreed and understood. I probably would not satisfy anyone at Red Lake because that process would probably take some time. Probably wouldn't satisfy folks at Washkish who would be worried about, you know, white folk not having access to the lake. They'd still have access. Um, but ultimately, that's what reconciliation is. Both parties give something up in order to engineer a more just and equitable outcome. And so there are many other examples of land back. Each has its own context and so forth and needs to be evaluated on its own. But I do think, you know, when a, one human is injured another, you hurt your friend's feelings. Well, we, we own our stuff. We say, I am so sorry. I care about you. I care about our relationship. I did something that caused you pain. And I want to apologize for that. And I also want to ask, what can I do to make it right? And if the injury was big enough where the apology is accepted and there's some effort at repair, it might pop up again later. Somebody gets triggered or they're hurt feelings. So you don't just say sorry once. If it pops up again and some your friend's feeling wonky, then you say, I'm, I'm so sorry. Um, I realize I did this. I know it's been a little while, but I'm still willing to do whatever it takes. And it's possible to stay in relationship with someone even after an injury if there is this effort and willingness to own the stuff and to repair. If someone's like, don't talk about that, it's a lot harder to stay in relationship or to reconcile. And so ultimately, we don't get to healed by skipping all the healing. And we don't get to reconciled by skipping all the reconciling. We have to do the things. And as we do, we will have to own our stuff. We will have to tell the truth about history. You know, when something has happened, you can lie about it. 
You can obfuscate the truth, but the truth endures and it'll keep popping up. So we do have to own this stuff and we do have to seek to repair. It'll be an imperfect and ongoing process, but that's how we get to healed and reconciled because truth and reconciliation begins with truth. Miigwech. Miigwech for watching today. I'm Anton Troyer.